in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I'm joined by members of my executive team. Uh, we have just finished our annual presentation to the council on the district's 28th balanced budget, uh, which is just under $20 billion uh, and includes investments uh, in the district's priorities. I think you heard some themes in that presentation uh, in, in that we are uh, we were faced with a budget season uh, that included decreased revenues and increased cost. Uh, and we've made the tough choices that were needed to be made to both balance the budget and invest um, in the district's strate strategic priorities that would allow us uh, to uh, to make sure that we're on the path uh, to a comeback in our downtown uh, area, as well as investing in our people and growing our city. So with that, these guys will take all the tough questions. Questions? Sam? Yes, Mayor, I noticed that the buses didn't come up. Uh, the, obviously, the council had asked for uh, free bus service in DC. Um, uh, could you talk about that and the fact that you're cutting, I understand, circulator buses in half? What? Yes, so um, we recognize that there is going to be a continued discussion over the district's investment in transit. Um, the council advanced a bill late last year uh, to make Metro bus free. Uh, and we expect, um, based on what they've said, that they will continue um, to work through the budget uh, process to do exactly that. I have um, issued some cautionary remarks about that. Um, number one, and I've asked the, the CFO uh, to update his analysis because I think there's been some new information presented uh, since the council took that emergency vote uh, back in December. Um, so I think it's important for the council members to carefully consider the cost. Um, what it would cost to provide um, free Metro bus in the district, um, not, this, not just this year, but throughout the financial plan. Uh, what does it mean for the existing Kids Ride Free program? Uh, I, I have to admit, when this was discussed uh, by the council in December, I thought that it, the, the free bus would offset Kids Ride Free. Um, and not be additive to the $26 million we already spend on kids right free. So I think there needs to be some confirmation around how those programs interact. We also know that Metro uh, is planning uh, to introduce a region-wide reduced fare program um, for low-income residents across the region. So how does that interact? Uh, and the requirement, which was not considered in the December vote, was free metro access um, right. So taking all that together, I hope that the council proceeds with all of the up-to-date cost information. Uh, what you will see in my budget proposal is we don't make huge new program investments. Uh, and that is the context um, that we entered this, this budget year in. Uh, and that I hope continues throughout the discussion. Uh, we also, in because we're having this transit discussion, um, look very closely at our costs for the DC uh, circulator, the ridership of the DC circulator, and how it fits into the larger transit discussion, uh, and made the decision to, um, to recommend eliminating three, three of the six routes. Why is that? I just said. I'm saying, why is why are you eliminating three of the routes? I just explained Can you that. Explain again. I <laughs> well, I could, Sam, but it may be helpful. Um, Kevin, why don't you just walk through again um, the kind of the the transit decisions that we need to make? Uh, thank you. So, when we looked at the issue, we did look at throughout the budget where are there opportunities to be able to reallocate funding where. The funding may not be getting the return um, uh, that would justify keeping it. So I worked at the DC Department of Transportation uh, 20 years ago when circulator services started. The original line was Union Station to Georgetown, which is one of the three lines that will still be in, in place. Uh, running a bus service is a much less expensive um, 
endeavor then than it is now. Uh, so now we have a third party company that provides the management of the service. Uh, the, at, the, at, the labor costs have increased substantially. And because of the need for electrification, if you run a bus service, you also have to buy electric buses. You have to have charging stations. You have to change how you do maintenance. So keeping the six routes, uh, expanding it, which has had been a discussion as well, would have required us to add substantial amounts to our recurring budget uh, to cover the operating cost annually. And we also would have had to put over $100 million into the capital budget to make sure we built out the electrification infrastructure, the maintenance infrastructure, to be able to sustain the program. We looked at all of that, um, tens of millions more annually for operating, over 100 million in capital, knowing that many of the routes have relatively low ridership compared to Amada bus routes, uh, the decision was made to, be, to reduce three of the routes. Mr. City Administrator, can I follow up on that and just ask, will any of the current employees with the circulator lose their jobs because of these cuts? Uh, I don't know enough about the bench depth of the existing operation to know the ripple effect it will have on uh, filled well, positions. Well, are those D.C. government employees or those? They're not D.C. government employees. So, so it is possible people are going to lose their jobs because of these budget cuts. Uh, it is possible, but WMATA, probably the most in-demand um, uh, profession to have right now is a licensed CDL driver. Uh, WMATA has an enormous number of vacancies for bus drivers. Uh, so to the extent that there are, for, there are losses of filled positions, there is also many opportunities, including at WMATA, to be able to pick them up. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'm wondering about the DC Crime Lab. Um, seeing in the budget that uh, slashing staff at the lab by more than 58%, transferring 82 FTEs from crime sciences to, D to DC police, and 31 FTEs to the public health crime lab. I understand, obviously, very well that the DFS has not been used for two years, essentially, because it's been unaccredited. Is part of this because of that, you know, you have to use what you got? Or is it you, you're losing faith that D DFS will actually regain accreditation? No, um, I'm not losing faith, um, but we are recommending with this budget uh, to change some of the structure of the work that DFS does. I'm gonna ask um, the city administrator to explain. Um, I think I would frame these changes as allowing DFS to focus on their core work and getting back to accreditation for the scientific work around uh, looking at evidence collected at crime scenes. Uh, so um, crime scene investigations, which is not part of the core scientific forensic lab, uh, came from MPD to DFS a few years ago. Um, even since that transfer in, MPD has always had to supplement their staffing level, often with trained or reserve officers to be able to supplement the staff available to collect crime scenes. That's going back to MPD. Um, which is where it happened until a few years ago. Uh, and the public health lab um, is going to be part of DC Health. Uh, this will allow the crime lab to focus squarely on getting accreditation back and being able to do the core work that's reflective of what every other forensic lab in the country does, which is the core work of testing evidence. Um, how does the budget help advance uh, affordable housing goals? Uh, the 2025 mark, and I'm asking because um, speaking in uh, about the um, the downtown investment with the inclusionary zoning, it seems like with the um, with the overtures being made to um, developers, there may not be opportunities for you know to meet that goal. And I'm speaking because there were proposals made to purchase buildings to create affordable housing in those units. Uh, so, you know, with that, how close are we to meeting these goals given, you know, the situation that, that the budget was in? Thank you for the question. My name is Jenny Reed and I'm Mayor Bowser's Director of the Office of Budget and Performance Management. Uh, we continue to make investments in affordable housing in this year's budget. They are not as high as we wanted them to be given the financial circumstances, but there's a new hundred million dollars invested in the Housing Production Trust Fund. We continue investments in our local rent supplement program vouchers that are needed to make some of that housing that the Housing Production Trust Fund produces affordable to very, very low income residents. Uh, we are investing in the rehabbing of the public housing stock and making more of those units online. 
Uh, we are also investing as part of that housing and downtown tax abatement. There are set aside requirements for affordability at moderate income levels. Um, we are, we have two goals. Um, one is to create additional 36,000 units by 2025, 12,000 of them affordable. We're about 70% of the way on the affordability goal. This will help get us a little bit further. Um, and then we'll have to look really closely at how those different proposals to come in to know if we're going to have to extend that deadline a little bit farther out. Follow up question. But as far as the inclusionary zoning, um, isn't there some limitation with that in terms of meeting the goal? You know, just given the fact that some people might qualify, even though as expensive as it is to live in DC, you know, all of us to some degree are housing insecure. So in speaking with residents in my job, sometimes, you know, with expenses, it just doesn't quite match up, you know, which is why I'm asking the question, because from what I understand, inclusionary zoning doesn't quite allow everybody who's housing insecure to get affordable housing. That's true. Inclusionary zoning is one tool in our toolbox. It is not the, it's not what, um, it's not the only thing that will allow us to allow to have more people live in the district. Uh, in part of our strategic plan, our five-year plan um, in our comeback plan, which we have dubbed it, is to focus how we increase um, the, the incomes of DC residents, especially um, black Washingtonians, and that is um, our goal. I announced earlier that for the first time since I've been mayor, we have unemployment numbers in the district um, in wards seven and eight that are below two digits. So we were over 10% unemployment in wards seven and eight, um, definitely ward eight, I think ward seven when I became mayor and now we're, we're below. There's really no better time uh, to, to get a good paying job uh, in Washington, D.C. And part of our focus and investments in this budget make sure we're preparing D.C. residents um, to do all of those things from our investments at OSSI in the D.C. Futures Program that allows tuition payments in high demand fields to our investments in advanced technical um, centers that are preparing our D.C. public school students um, for, for work uh, in our high demand field. So uh, that uh, we cannot forget has to be our, our focus on making DC more affordable uh, for more people. Uh, we're also very focused on making sure every neighborhood in Washington DC has the type of amenities to attract more DC residents. Keep in mind that our overarching goal is 15,000 new residents in the downtown and 25,000 more, um, or is it 35,000 more citywide as part of our five-year plan? Um, so we can continue to focus on those things. Um, regarding the uh, addition of speed cameras and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't see where you were coming from. No, that's okay, I should have stood. Uh -huh. um, regarding the addition of the speed cameras, uh, and, and the amount of money that you all expected to generate, uh, I think $580 million uh, over annually. The, over the, no, over the plan. Over the plan, over the plan which okay. is five years, oh, four so years. Four years or five years, I'm sorry. Four years. Four years, okay, sorry about four. that. Um, four years. <laughs> um, the, I, I'm sure you hear frustration about the number of speed cameras there are already. Uh, there, you could interpret this as a way of you all trying to fill this shortfall by you know, putting that cost on the backs of commuters. What do you say to people who think we don't need more speed cameras and that this is a, a frustrating way to generate revenue in the District of Columbia? Two things. Uh, what I hear most is that people are tired of reckless driving and people needlessly dying on our streets. Uh, I also hear that Bowser, you gotta do more for traffic fatalities. That's what I hear. Uh, what I know uh, in, in doing this for a number of years now that from Ward 8 to Ward 3 and every place in between, uh, there's too much speeding and reckless driving. I also know um, that our ATM enforcement has shown um, benefits over the years that we've been involved in it. Uh, and I also know uh, that the advance towards these um, deployment of speed cameras happened two years ago, not this year. Um, but now we are getting to the actual um, deployment of those cameras uh, and the revenue that they generate has to be recognized. I hope we don't collect 
anything from the, the cameras because you know what that would mean people aren't driving recklessly aren't running red lights they're staying out of bus lanes they're not running stop signs uh, and people can get across the district more safely and if um, that is realized then we'll also realize reductions in revenue in the remainder of the financial plan and just to follow up on that I know there was a discussion of a task force and a possible kind yes. of sliding scale can you just talk about uh, that process, what that conversation's been like, what you, what that might look like. Sure. Um, yeah. There are um, rightly questions about how ticket enforcement or AT enforcement affects behavior, and also how flat fees affect people of different incomes differently. Um, and quite candidly, if they affect black and brown communities uh, more dramatically than, than other communities. Um, and so we want that task force to address those issues so that we have the most effective um, policies um, possible. Yep. I may have got following up on, on the cameras. What a lot of people are concerned about uh, is the enforcement. You acknowledge that 70% or 30% go unpaid of, of these tickets. But you know what we're seeing most recently is we see somebody who had twelve thousand dollars, more than forty outstanding tickets over more than a year, and there seems to be no actions taken against that driver, and that driver killed three people. So that's you know so that's certainly not making the street safer. So what do you say, regardless of the revenue stream, just the, the safety component? What will you do to enforce these traffic cameras and actually? collect the money and hold these people. I think you called them, I can't remember your phrase the other day when you, were, when you talked about these repeat offenders, but holding them accountable rather than just allowing, particularly the out of state, where there's no reciprocity, to just rack up ticket after ticket after ticket with, with no consequences. Mark, I think there's work to do. Um, and I think we have to find the most effective way to do that work and enforce it and the right people um, to enforce that work, um, and we're going we're gonna to keep working at it uh, to do it. So do we want people to have $12,000 worth of tickets? No. Might we have been able to put a boot on their car? Possibly. Could we have impounded their car? Possibly. Could their driver's license be revoked? Po you know, I don't even know all the, the ways that that happens. But I still know that a scoff law, which I would consider that person a reckless driver in a scoff law, if they are intent on driving recklessly, they probably will find a way. Um, so let's focus, we're very focused on how we are making the program work for most people, and I think 70% payment rate is, is not bad. Um, but we also have to figure out how we address the scoff laws. Mayor Bowser, your budget proposal calls for abolishing the Criminal Code Commission in fiscal 24. Can you talk about the rationale behind that? Well, the Criminal Code Commission has finished its work uh, and made its recommendations to the council. Right. Is the city, are you, wouldn't they be involved in the construction of a new criminal code proposal? I think that remains uh, to be determined. Determined when? I don't know when it's going to be determined. Um, we recommend, and they've had many, many years of work, they rate, made recommendations to the council, um, so I don't know what other work they need to do. The council and the mayor are the policy makers for the city, and so I believe that that work remains among the 14 of us. Okay, so you aren't planning the rest of this fiscal year, even next fiscal year, to introduce a new set of proposals around this? You had introduce your own proposals to improve I didn't say that. Did. I said that the work of the Criminal Code Review Commission, in my view, is done. They, they submitted their report to the council. They were established to work on a report and a set of recommendations for the council, and they've done that. Okay. Um, jumping into something that came up at the breakfast with Councilmember White and Councilmember Nadeau is spending on ERAP. The budget is $8 million. It's, you know, it's now currently 43 or so, and it's already been spent through. You know, how do you talk, how do you justify that, that level of reduction? Like, kind of like, I mean, there's still, rents are still going up, people are still in need, so how, how is $8 million going to be sufficient given the $43 million that's already been spent for the current year? Well, we look at the needs um, in the city, uh, especially related when those increases were made to ERAP. We were in a pandemic, people were not vaccinated, there wasn't a safe and effective vaccine, uh, and people couldn't go to work. 
um, those, those circumstances have changed. I, I had a question about HPTF. Um, my understanding is that at the end of 2022, there was something like $220 million in excess revenue. You know, that was going to flow, you know, half to HPTF, half to PAYGO. Now the number you get to is $100 million for this budget. I'm just kind of curious what, what accounts uh, for that difference. Can you give me that again? And I'm going to ask Jenny to come up. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, HPTF, yes. uh, at the end of 2022, um, with the excess revenues uh, that were certified, my understanding it was something like $220 million that would go to both HPTF and then to PAYGO. So how do we get to $100 million in this budget? Uh, so the answer is that we utilize that surplus from FY22 to help close the gap, which is something we've done in prior years. And just so everybody knows, we had a $1.7 billion gap to close following the February um, revenue estimate that the CFO delivered. All right, we'll take a couple more. Okay. Yes, Mayor. So in the uh, uh, your previous presentation, you talked about non-police uh, working in downtown D.C. And I'm just curious, uh, you talked about it quite a bit, but... What are your ideas as to what these, who would play this role? I'm just curious what the police uh, chief might think about. What would these non-police do that would make downtown safer? Well, what I talked about, um, Sam, was kind of following what I believe is the council's intent over the last several years. I have a chart. Which... Uh, Apparently, I can't find anything this morning. But anyway, it's in here. Okay, give me one second. Here it is. Okay, this is our chart. And so you can see the number of sworn officers that have gone down since 2020. Um, and that is the year we couldn't hire. So we have fewer police officers in declining. And the question was, I believe, earlier, how can we get more police? How can we respond to the business community's request for more police in the downtown? And my response was, how can we have more public safety presence that doesn't include police, more police, because we just don't have the numbers to have special units. That's not to say, and I'm gonna ask the chief to come up, that we don't have police presence in the downtown because we certainly do. But to have enhanced presence, um, I believe that everybody um, plays a role, um, including our non-police officials in the district, um, like the ones that serve on our nightlife task forces, but also we have a lot of private security presence uh, and we have bids, which are part of that private security presence uh, that include ambassadors. So we have a lot of people, some of them in uniform, um, some of them in some of our other programs or in other government agencies that are gonna help enhance um, presence uh, in our downtown. So if I could just have um, the police chief talk about deployment strategies uh, in the downtown and working with our other partners on presence. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. But uh, Sam, so to your question, uh, you know, you've heard me talk a lot about uh, public safety just really being, not being a solely a police issue. It, it's really uh, all hands involved in the issue, in the space of public safety. And I think the mayor just hit on it a couple of uh, seconds ago when she talked about our nightlife task force and what we believe uh, to be really the future uh, in this space. And it is uh, the deployment of government resources, not just police, but uh, as an add-on to police to get that visible presence. So for example, um, you know, it we have ticket writers who write tickets in communities in downtown. Uh, there could be an opportunity at some point for other people, non-police people, to take uh, non-emergency type reports, a theft report, for example. Uh, so looking really at uh, other, other ways that we can increase our 
government footprint, but beyond the government footprint, bringing in our partners from the private sector space, uh, ambassadors, et cetera, really folks focused in on being visible and present in these communities where we don't have uh, the police officers. Now, to the mayor's point, do we deploy police officers to the downtown areas? And not, absolutely we do, but we don't have the number, I, I guess, that people would expect to see, as the mayor chart indicates. We don't have the officers that we had back in 2020, so what do we do? We don't just throw up our hands. I think this is an opportunity to look at other D.C. residents, potentially, to be hired in this space uh, to do the non-police functions. Uh, for example, we have security guards without weapons. They go and check alarms, as an example. They go and check alarms, and, you know, if, if the door's not broken and it's something running around that caused the alarm to go off, that doesn't require a police officer to respond. So it's really just trying to think creatively uh, other ways that we can do business and, and still uh, make sure that our communities feel safe. Chief Breyer, Mike. Yeah. Could you update us on Alabama Avenue, please? Yeah, so we had a shooting uh, last night around 9 o'clock, uh, just after 9 o'clock p.m., where uh, we had two young men, one 16, one 15, uh, who were uh, on a motorbike bike in the 2200 block of Alabama Avenue southeast. Uh, we know uh, so far that there were some individuals who were uh, in a vehicle. Uh, they at some point observed these two, um, these two young men on the motorbike abruptly stopped, uh, got out of the vehicle, uh, fire shots uh, striking uh, these two young men, uh, unfortunately fatally uh, killing one of the young men. Uh, we believe that that vehicle uh, left the scene. Uh, we believe that we've located uh, that vehicle uh, later on that night. It was burned. Uh, at a location in the District of Columbia. So obviously, forensically, we're going uh, through that. Uh, that's the information that we have uh, as of this morning. Uh, obviously, if we have any uh, images or anything like that that we're going to release to the community, uh, we're, we're going through Coleman for video today, uh, checking metro buses that were in the area, that kind of thing, to be able to provide any video um, that might be helpful in this investigation. Un we're unfortunate, uh, unfortunately, we don't know what the motive is, why someone would choose uh, that time of the evening to shoot, and shoot, this, shoot these two young men, uh, but it's part of the investigation, so our homicide guys are working on it. Is there an exchange of gunfire? I don't believe it was an exchange. Again, this is very preliminary, Mark, but I, as of this morning, I don't believe that there was an exchange of gunfire, or definitely not from the young men who were shot. You know, they, were they targeted, the two on the motor? Oh, we definitely believe that the two young men were targeted, and that's very unfortunate. I have a budget question for the chief. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, wondering, I, I heard that you, you got all of your uh, staffing needs met. What does that mean from a number standpoint? And can you explain if any of your requests were based on the fact that you are now helping out Metro with security? Well, uh, it has nothing to do with, uh, with Metro, but, you know, we, we have had very intense discussions about uh, with the hiring projection, what, what does it look like, a realistic projection of, of what we can bring uh, into the door and have ultimately these officers on the streets of the District of Columbia. So we wanted to be realistic in that space, uh, continue to focus on our police cadet program as a pipeline. Uh, I'm very happy with what I'm seeing there. We have over 125 D.C. residents, the majority from Ward 7 and 8, uh, kids that are in our police cadet pipeline that ultimately will become uh, police officers uh, here in the District of Columbia. So, uh, you know, as the mayor mentioned, you know, she, you know, here, here's her chart. I mean, this is a, this is a real number. And, you know, while we, we have people who, you know, you know, they, we want police presence. I was at a community meeting last night. At, um, I was at the restaurant association yesterday talking with, with folks and they, they certainly uh, want to see uh, the police presence, but we want to be re very realistic about what that will look like real as we move into the, as we move into the future. Topic question for the chief. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what's the conversation around police training to prevent situations where arrests don't lead to convictions? The conversation around police training, well, there's a lot of things that go into that. Uh, it's not just about police training. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, for example, you have a person who gets robbed right outside of the library by a guy who's masked up with, you know, with a COVID mask and the witness can't identify him. That doesn't have anything to do with police training. We just have a person who's unable to identify um, uh, who the suspect is in that case. So while we may make an arrest in that case, and the case doesn't get prosecuted, again, nothing to do with police training. It's really just the facts of the case. Uh, if you're talking like specifically about something like, uh, for example, around uh, a Fourth Amendment issue or something like an officer 
uh, uh, his search was not the best search or the prosecutors don't want to move forward with a case because of a search or something like that. Those are things that we constantly train on. Uh, we work with our partners at the OAG's office, at the U.S. Attorney's office uh, to identify in our monthly meetings. Matter of fact, I think I have a meeting with the USAO today and his team uh, to identify any issues uh, in any spaces that um, that adversely impact cases to take those things back to train our officers on. So that's a constant thing that we're doing. But I would not, you know, I think it, it, would, it would be an error to n narrowly focus uh, on police training or, or, or some issue with police training to say that's why cases are not being prosecuted. Yeah. Follow up question? Sure. What's the status of the investigation involving Delaney O'Martin? Who? Which one? Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. I thought you were talking about another. Okay. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, that just happened over the weekend. Uh, MPD uh, Internal Affairs, uh, we're investigating that case. Uh, it's unfortunately someone lost their life, but uh, as we do in any case involving uh, the use of force by a law enforcement officer in the District of Columbia, the Metropolitan Police Department has primary uh, jurisdiction and authority over that investigation. Uh, once we complete uh, our preliminary findings, uh, that information will then be uh, per passed, on, passed along to the United States Attorney's Office, where ultimately a decision will be made about whether or not um, the shooting was, was justified, not justified, legal, lawful, unlawful, and then we would go from there. But right now, our team is still gathering uh, information from the weekend, and then that information will be submitted to the U.S. Attorney's Office. And the status of the officer that went in the back seat of the car? Uh, it's a U.S. It was a U.S. Park Police officer. Uh, I'm not. Last I heard, it was a, a, a. He may have been treated for some injuries and released or something, but um, uh, I'm not sure what his duty status is. Thank you. Okay. Um, off topic. If it's a legal question, we'll reset for those later. Um, off topic. On anything else? You have an on topic, Martin. Yeah. Okay, I see you shaking your head, so I'm not sure where, yeah. where you want to go with that. Go ahead. On the budget. Um, so you heard, uh, again, some council members concerned about this $578 million of revenue from expected revenue from the traffic cameras, the fact that you guys are proposing a change to the law so it no longer goes just to Vision Zero projects. Let's say the council decides that they want it all to go to Vision Zero projects. How does that impact the rest of the budget? Like, what's the impact? About $578 million. Uh, less the, the other investments that we are already have in Vision Zero. Does that answer your question? So this is, this is how it works, and I think, and I'm going to use this as a quick primer on how the budget works. Uh, we, based on the CFO's revenue estimates uh, and on our own costs, uh, we propose a balanced budget to the council. That is my charter authority. Uh, the council then has 70 days um, by statute. Um, they will hold public hearings, uh, and they have the charter authority to approve or amend my proposal. So that's the stage that, that we're in now. Uh, and every year, there are some changes. Um, and the thing that I hope that you recognize from our proposal uh, is we're focused on the fiscal stability of the district and we think that we have made uh, very sound approaches uh, to help bring us out of the pandemic, to grow um, our population, to invest in our people, and to continue to attract businesses and residents to the district. That's the long-term stability. Uh, we've had some, to make some, some tough choices here. They impact vacant positions. They impact what we think are some programs and services that have been underperforming and redirects those programs and services. We continue to make very robust investments in our facilities, uh, which we know have been a part of the 15-year the renaissance of Washington, D.C., and we know it's important to continue to make those investments in schools and parks and recreation in new parks uh, and services and also in new destinations and activities that will allow us um, to recreate um, the vibrancy of our city. We also have a focus on the basics, uh, and this is a message that my cabinet wants me to deliver loud and clear. We have to be good at the basics. Um, and so some of the emphasis that you saw on 
um, facilities, uh, small, what we call small capital repairs, is making sure um, that we have what we need in terms of our buildings and our ability to make sure that we're delivering um, for the people of the District of Columbia. Uh, what you will also see is from us um, scant new spending proposals. So we've had to true up because of inflation some programs that I committed to or the council is committed to to make sure we can deliver them, but we have very few things that are, that are new. Uh, one of them is my after school DC um, that will allow us uh, to really focus on on our parents and families in DC, which are going to be a huge part of how we grow our population. Uh, and so one of those programs uh, is My After School DC. We also expand uh, the eligibility for a child care subsidy, uh, which will allow more than 2,000 more DC families to qualify for subsidized child care. So those things are, are hugely important uh, to how we grow. So the, the figure that you refer to, Martin, uh, is part of um, other looks across our budget to make sure we're balancing, um, but not having to cut deep uh, into the programs and services that everyone cares about. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor, I yep. have one question uh, off topic. Getting to the uh, deputy mayor, the former deputy mayor. We're going to handle those later. I'm going to come back to the podium. Oh, you are? Okay. Yep. We'll reset and handle those in a minute. All right. Thank you, everybody. We now return to our previously scheduled program, Already in Progress. The e-bike fleet we're celebrating today, it shows us what's possible when we invest in our residents and in our businesses and our transportation to get around the city without needing a car for every single trip. So I think our e-bikes and the cabbie fleet are helping more district residents um, on their own get, to get used to e-bikes, uh, help people get around our city. Um, it also reduces traffic congestion for those who do need to drive and it moves us towards our climate change goals. So.